Let's pray. Jesus, we, we look and we see the story of Peter today as he comes sits by that charcoal fire with you. And he remembers all that that means to him. Places of shame and guilt, frustration with himself. And around that charcoal fire, Lord, you remind him that he is loved and forgiven. Grace and mercy that you've given to him and that you've sent him out to share that in a world where people recognize and see their sin and shame and, and struggle with it. Lord, we pray today that you would help us to know what our charcoal fire is, the moments of shame that you've turned to grace and mercy and forgiveness and prepare us to be able to share that with this world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our mountaintop moments fade all too quickly. I married into a wonderful family, a family that is such a blessing to me, and Papa and Gigi know the, the value of making sure that my marriage still has moments to be able to, to focus on one another. And so they took my kids the last several days and, and were with them so that Mindy and I could spend some time together, be best friends, hear each other's stories, talk about what's going on in our lives without all the distractions that we normally have of the focus of the people that we're serving, whether teaching or preaching and the kids that we serve daily. And so Mitty and I had those wonderful mountaintop moments, and we're still in the glow of that, and yet we know tomorrow is coming. The day when we move back into our week and our routine, and all of the details will then become a part of our lives of just organizing that and talking back and forth about that. And today when we see Peter, he's, he's in that mountaintop moment. He's in that mountaintop moment where the resurrection just happened, so even greater than the earthly blessings the Lord gives us, here is this eternal blessing that he gets to see in the flesh. And from that moment, he moves on to go back to work. And that's where our reading begins this morning. That's where our reading all of a sudden starts, is that we see Peter going back to life. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And I think it's important noting as we see the entry into this reading that that sea has many different names. Sometimes that can be confusing to us and we can get stuck on that in Scripture, but it's also called the Sea of Galilee, Chinnereth, and Gesset. Gonna say it. And so those uh, help understandings help pull us away from any distraction of just saying, okay, it has different names for whatever reason, but that's the sea that they're by. So Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And while as simple as this might seem, what we see here is Peter going back to work. Their life, their living, their understanding of what it meant to have a livelihood and make sure they had food and maintain their family and did all that. So they have this mountaintop moment and then they go back to work. They go back to the details of work and the challenges of work and all that. Now, Peter might have enjoyed fishing. We don't know. But certainly the frustration of catching nothing was there. And the realization that we know from the beginning of Scripture is that work meant challenging. It meant the reminder of sin. Genesis 3, 17-19 begins that understanding for us that work will have these moments. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have, have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And we hear those words that began our Lenten season, that Ash Wednesday moment, but even more specifically, the words that work is work. It has all the challenges of, of work around it to be able to eat and to be able to maintain and provide for the family. And Peter, again, after this mountaintop moment of the resurrection, come back, back to work, and he caught nothing. And so as much as he knows the, the resurrection is life-changing, He's left to realize that he is still in the struggles and the pains 
of this world. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. And the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. Now Jesus shows up as they're fishing. And the Greek word really means, do you have something to eat? But it often had an assumption in that word that it was something about a fish. And so our translation brings those understandings together so that we can say, hey, do you have some fish to eat? And that helps us to know that was a general question. Now, he knew that they didn't, but he's, he's asking that for that understanding, that frustration that they still feel as they deal with the sins and the pains and the struggles of the world. And remember that they were fishing at night. What happens at night? If we look into another book of John, we see that John does that comparison of night and light. He talks about the difference of what happens in the evening and the night and daybreak. And our world recognizes this today too, right? They talk about and have songs about nothing good happens after two. So there's this understanding that in the night, it is not good. Things don't happen the way that you would want them to. You have regret and, and, and challenges that you face in the night. And John does that comparison in 1 John. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That light and dark comparison stands out. And here we see Jesus coming in the daybreak. The light is showing and something is about to change. Something is about to transform in them to, to know how because of the resurrection, even though they still face the, power, the challenges and the struggles and the sins of this world, they still face the curses of Adam that are on them until the final day that because of the resurrection, there is a newness of living in Jesus. And there was understandings about the sea and the waters and what the sea and the waters meant to them too. The, the messages they had heard from so long of comparing the seas to the, be the challenges of life, of the nations, of the foreigners that would come against them. We saw that read by our field worker today, Chuck. Ah, oh, the thunder of many peoples. They thunder like the thundering of the sea. Ah, oh, the roar of the nations. They roar like the roaring of the mighty waters. The nations roar like the roaring of many waters. But He will rebuke them, and they will flee far away, chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, behold, terror. Before the morning, they are no more. This is the portion of those who loot us, and the lot of those people who plunder us. And so we see again, both in this passage, the comparison of the waters, of the struggle of the waters, of the storms of the waters, and of the night of what they will face. And all of this fits together in this beautiful story of Jesus again coming in the resurrection to say how life is different because He has come back. The danger and the sin of the world exists, but in the light... Jesus changes everything. It goes on in the reading to say, He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find them. So they cast it. And now they were able to haul it in because of the quantity. They were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Jesus redeems them in the light. The lack of fish that they had, the lack of food, the lack of provision, the frustrations that they felt of this world, and all of a sudden their boat is overflowing because of Jesus. Now the resurrected Jesus, He has come to redeem what they face in the world the work that they face, the struggles that they face, and how, what it means in the night to, to wonder, will they ever get out of this? Will they be able to take care of all the people in their life? Will they be able to provide for their very family? And Jesus, in the light, gives them so much, it's overwhelming. It's hard for them to carry in. And Peter, in that moment, sees it's the Lord, and he gets so excited that a switch flips in him, and he swims to Jesus. 
Because He sees what it means to know Jesus. To be in His presence. And that life has now changed because of what Jesus has done. When they got to land, they saw a charcoal fire in, in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now in order to process this, we take a moment of saying a charcoal fire. Why is John so specific with the charcoal fire? And that's the title of this message today. What is your charcoal fire? Peter, in that moment, could have and would later remember the charcoal fire he was at a few days ago. I'll take you back there. John 18. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not of this man's disciples, are you? He said to him, I'm not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. You see, the charcoal fire was the place where Peter denied Jesus. He promised he would never do that. There's no way he would ever deny his Lord and Savior. And he did it around a charcoal fire. The charcoal fire is where Peter denied Jesus in the dark. But now, he believes in Jesus in the light. This charcoal fire is now a moment to have both moments together, to be surrounded for it. It's Jesus' deja vu. Of all the sudden, there's this moment of shame, of everything that he said he would never do, and he fought so hard not to. And then standing around that charcoal fire, he denied his Lord and Savior. And now Jesus, in His graveness, in His resurrected body, the one who comes to redeem us in the midst of our moments of shame, in the moments that we said the sins that we would never do, comes to forgive Peter, feed him, love him, give him grace and mercy and redeem his story. And no longer take that memory with a charcoal fire. Every time he saw it, he felt shame. And now take it as something where he sees the power of his Lord and Savior who forgives, loves, and changes his story. And now takes him to know that because Jesus can transform his story, he can transform anybody's story. That moment of shame, of pain that they have, can be transformed into a story of forgiveness, of grace, of mercy, of knowing who Jesus truly is. We all have those stories. I thought a lot about a lot of those stories. There's there's so many this week. And I like, what story do I want to tell this week that just capitalizes and talks about that moment where my story was a surrounding by the brokenness of life and all of a sudden the Lord redeemed that. Over the last several years, that story has happened for me through something that I wouldn't have ever thought would happen. Basketball was something to me that was a beautiful way of taking time to go talk to Jesus about the challenges I was having in life. A lot of that had to do with the brokenness of my family and how I was managing that, the relationships I could see around me that I had trusted and and the way that they were falling apart. And I shot all day long on a basketball hoop to be able to talk to the Lord through those moments. And that felt in some ways like redemption. It was this place where Jesus and I would go that I would talk to him. And then I loved basketball so much that I wanted to play it. And into high school, when I first got cut, then I moved to the Lutheran high school and got to play it there. But then I found myself on the bench. And my story again became a place where this was this moment where Jesus and I would talk on the basketball hoop to a moment of feeling rejected and denied and and not feeling like it was this place of peace, but a place of shame. And then life went on. And life changed, and I knew that that brokenness of my family, that I shot on the basketball hoop and prayed to the Lord that I wanted that to be different in life. 
And over the last several years, I have found myself sitting on the bleachers again, the bench. But the bench this time is on the other side, watching my boys, watching them play basketball, watching them fall in the love of the sport. And in those moments, I have this glimpse of this place that was once a place where I was dealing with all the pains and struggles of the world has now become this beautiful place of a connection with my family, a connection with my sons, the love that I have for them, the family that the Lord has redeemed and given me that I prayed about and wanted to be and no longer is basketball this image of all these challenges, but it's an image of the beauty and the gift of family that the Lord has given me. What is your charcoal fire. I want to help our members of our church, I want to help people at Mount Calvary think about those moments in their life. They exist in so many different ways that we have these places we don't want to talk about with one image, like a charcoal fire, that we can pick out and say, this is the place where I felt shame and guilt and frustration. And how has Jesus redeemed that? How has He taken that picture that once meant something that you never wanted to talk about and changed it to be something that you want to share with the world and that you see God's grace and mercy and forgiveness for you. This next part of our Scripture passage is so well known, but so often taken out of the context of the charcoal fire with Peter. And I want you to hear it again read to you But in that context of now what he's asking Peter to do, Peter having these two images of the charcoal fire of shame, now of his Lord and Savior redeemed, restoring that image to him, and then what does Jesus say to Peter? When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you were to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but now you are old. You will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Then he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify him. And after saying these things, he said this, follow me. After the charcoal fire moment where Jesus redeems this story, he sends Peter out to feed his people. To speak that love and forgiveness and grace and mercy into their places of shame. The resurrection continues. We don't just have our Easter moment and then we move on. The resurrection continues in the opportunity for each of us to be able to talk about those charcoal fire stories. I keep praying for the times to to share that with you. To, that we would each have those that energy to be able to think about being extraordinary servants in that way, to know that we have those stories and to focus on those stories so that we can see that and then live that out. It happens in all sorts of areas of our lives, places where we face loss and grief and sadness and pain and how God has transformed that image to be an image of His grace and mercy and forgiveness and of the resurrection and what it means means that we have life in Him and that any story, any place, any image can be transformed by Jesus our Lord and Savior. And then He sends us out, like Peter, to live that out for people. To find them in the midst of their loss, in the midst of their sin, in the midst of their grief. As they share with you a, a picture of a story of where they felt like Peter around that charcoal fire. And where you then get to share with them, I know someone who can redeem that story. I know someone who can take you to that same place. That place where you once felt shame and make it a place of victory. A place where you feel peace. A place where you feel love and forgiveness. And my prayer for Mount Calvary isn't that we try and figure out how we do that as one big event as a church, but that we walk alongside one another 
as we each live that out in our own ways, in our own stories, and then we get to share that with one another. We get to live with Peter where maybe Jesus asked him three times so he recognizes, he gets to see just what Jesus has done. He has trained, changed that image of that charcoal fire into this beautiful, wonderful thing. And he gets to live that out by helping other people to do that too. My prayer for us at Mount Calvary is that we have those charcoal fire moments and then we help other people see our resurrected Lord around their charcoal fire moment as extraordinary servants who look and share with the broken and the shamed, but you know, the God of life, of forgiveness, of mercy, and of grace. Let's pray. Jesus, help us keep seeing what the resurrection means in our lives. We have some charcoal fires of shame. Thank you for redeeming those moments. Jesus, help find others gathered around the same fire and give us the words to speak the truth about your grace, mercy, and victory won in the resurrection. Amen. Please.